Okay, so I think we are ready to start. I want to welcome everybody here to this latest installment of our Maritime Heritage Lecture Series, uh, the Sharpies in North Carolina. Just before we get started, uh, just a couple housekeeping things. I do want to mention that this presentation will be recorded and ultimately uh, posted on either the museum's uh, well, on the museum's website. So if you miss it or you want to watch it again, please feel free to check out our website. That is also where we have posted previously recorded presentations. So you can go there as well to see other um, presentations by staff members. Along with today's presentation, I do want to mention that we have two other lectures coming up on April 29th, part of our Maritime Heritage Lecture Series. Our um, Associate Curator of Education, Ben Wonderly, will be doing a presentation on the explosion of the steamer Pulaski. And then on May 5th, our um, conservator here at the Maritime Museum System, uh, Michelle Crapeau, will be doing a presentation called It's Electrifying Conservation Basics, Electrolyte Reduction in Archaeological Conservation. Two very cool presentations that I hope you're able to join us for. Those will also be virtual, done on the same way these are through Zoom and through Facebook Live being recorded and then later posted on the museum's website. Now today we're going to have a great presentation by David Bennett. One thing I do want to mention is throughout his presentation he has put in slides that say questions um, that will ask you to ask your questions. We ask that you kind of save your questions until that point. Um, you can put but when you are ready to submit a question put them into the chat feature either through Zoom I will be monitoring that or through Facebook where we have another staff member monitoring that. Um, and then at those question slides, we will relay those questions on to David Bennett um, for him to address. Uh, without further ado, though, I hand this over to Mr. Bennett. David, the floor is yours. Hi. Uh, yeah, my name is David Bennett. I'm the curator of maritime uh, history with the North Carolina Maritime Museum System. And today we're going to be discussing uh, the Sharpie in North Carolina, um, primarily in the context of commercial fishing and coastal trade. I will touch lightly on uh, recreation um, as well, though. So um, what, what is the Sharpie? Uh, sort of the quintessential, the original uh, Sharpie originated out of New Haven, uh, Connecticut, primarily as an oyster tonging. Uh, boat for the oyster fishery um, on Long Island Sound. Um, the key features behind the boat um, are that it is it's a flat bottom boat with a hard shine. Um, it has a uh, it has a sharp bow um, section. It has a rounded stern. There's a centerboard. Um, there's usually three mast steps in the boat, so you could either um, sail with with two sails or just one usually if it was sailing with just one sail, it was usually in, in rougher weather um, but usually it was uh, set up with a, a leg of mutton uh, sail originally and that's what the sort of sail plan right here looks like so uh, how did it wind up in north carolina well first i'm just going to give you some quick historical background um, Following the Civil War, uh, there's this huge oyster boom going on within the United States. Um, a lot of people, um, particularly up north and, and out west, are benefiting from a really prosperous economy. There's expansion um, of transportation and trade networks throughout the United States through um, railroads and steamboats. There's newer um, technology coming into uh, processing food, uh, namely uh, steam canning. And um, basically from the end of the Civil War, War up until World War I, oysters are um, the most valuable uh, fishery in the United States. They're four times more valuable than salmon, which was the, the second most valuable fishery in the United States. So um, North Carolina, they wanted to get in on the action uh, with the oysters. Uh, prior to 1872, it was illegal to export um, oysters from the state, uh, but all, that all changed in 1872 uh, when the state um, established an oyster season and permitted the exportation of oysters. So uh, in this environment, you have George Ives uh, moves from New Haven 
Connecticut. Uh, he's originally um, from Connecticut. He moves down to Beaufort, North Carolina in 1874. Uh, prior to coming here, he had uh, been a co-owner in a keg um, company. Uh, they made, um, oops, a uh, typo there, um, oyster and gunpowder um, kegs is what they had made. And the factory had mysteriously burned down in 1872. We don't quite understand um, what was going on, but he and his entire family um, wound up moving to Beaufort to set up a fresh um, seafood and oyster wholesale distribution business. Um, later on, he relocated from Beaufort uh, to New Bern, um, where there's a larger um, fish uh, market and, and transportation and, and trade hub there. Um, but he maintained um, his business um, businesses in, in Carter County. And he's noted for um, introducing the sort of idea of shipping fresh fish and oysters um, on ice to North Carolina. Um, because with the hot climate, you just couldn't move um, fresh fish or oysters. A lot of times you just had to, uh, to salt, um, you had to, to pickle fish and brine. Um, and there's a changing appetite um, following the Civil War. People wanted fresher foods, they had money to purchase fresher foods, and that's what the market demanded. And so he had schooners filled with ice from New England coming to Moorhead City so they could pack these oysters up and these fish up and, and ship them by train. Um, to places like New York and Philadelphia and Baltimore, where they could really make um, some good money. Um, in order to get to these oysters, though, he needed um, fishermen and he needed um, oyster tonging boats. And at the time in Carteret County, the, the popular boat uh, for oyster tonging and just commercial fishing in general um, was the Cunner, uh, which is a split log dugout canoe boat, um, which is sort of pictured here in this photo. Um, these are uh, oyster boats um, in Beaufort. But um, George Ives, he didn't really care for these boats. They weren't going to be fast enough. They weren't going to carry the quantities of oysters that he knew the market was going to demand. And um, also the, the, the wood was becoming harder to get for these boats. You had to have big logs and it was expensive and time consuming uh, just to sort of build these boats. Um, and these sort of dugout canoe boats had been phased out in Connecticut in favor of the Sharpie by the time George Ives had moved to North Carolina. And here's another image of just what a cunner looks like. This one's from Hyde County. And then this is diagram is just roughly shows you how these boats were built. They split the log, carve out a boat, join it together in the middle. That's sort of in a nutshell, real quick um, picture of, of how they, they would build these boats. But like I said, the wood was becoming harder and harder to get. There was also um, these lap strake or clinker built boats, um, primarily pilot boats that were present um, in Carter County that were being used in the commercial fishing industry. But George Ives didn't see these boats as being a suitable um, oyster tonging boat either. And so um, he decided to go back home uh, to Connecticut uh, to get some Sharpies and bring them down to North Carolina. He ordered two, uh, the Lucia and the Ella um, in 1875. He ordered them from George Graves, who was a, a famous um, boat builder um, from Fairhaven, Connecticut. Uh, that summer he tested uh, the Sharpies out on Long Island Sound. Lucia performed uh, better than expected. And in, in the fall, he shipped those boats by schooner to Washington, North Carolina, and then he sailed them um, from Washington to Beaufort. Um, and he put them to work in Beaufort in 1876. He really hoped that the locals in Carter County would catch on and adopt the boat and start building them and using them that would help further his business interests um, in the fresh fish and oyster industry. Um, however, the locals didn't really like the boat. Um, it was a new um, sort of concept for them, these uh, flat bottom boats, um, sort of thinly constructed, and they weren't sure if they could really sail into the wind or, or do well, perform well in the rough inlets and sounds um, of eastern North Carolina. So they sort of stuck their nose up at the boat. 
Uh, to remedy the situation, George Ives challenged uh, the fastest boat in Carter County to a race, uh, which was the Sunnyside, uh, owned by Daniel Bell, um, uh, a fish dealer out of Moorhead City. And um, so they put, so in July 6, 1876, these two boats race um, from Harker's Point to Beaufort Inlet in some really rough weather, um, some heavy southwesterly winds um, on an ebb tide. So the tide's going out to sea. Um, and they had some money at stake as well, $50, uh, which would be more than $1,200 in today's money. Um, what we know about the sunny side is that it's one of these clinker built boats, might have been a pilot boat, might not have been, we're not sure. Um, but George Ives described it as being a 20 foot length overall um, boat, um, clinker built, so lap strake. You had the overlapping um, planks on the boat. It had a keel, we know that and is supposedly sharp, deep, and uh, a fast sailor. And uh, other descriptions of these sort of clinker uh, built boats in Beaufort describe them as being uh, spritzels as well. And so here's the track they took, started out um, Harker's Point and Harker's Island and sailed through the sound and through the inlet. Um, George Ives and his Sharpie the Lucia handedly defeated Daniel Bell in the sunny side, uh, the popular local boat. Um, a lot of people were said to have um, been watching this race from Bird um, Shoal and from Carrot Island. And Daniel Bell, um, he lost to this uh, Connecticut Sharpie, the Lucia, and he was so intrigued by it that he, um, hired Cicero Willis of Smyrna, North Carolina to build him a modified uh, replica of Lucia. Um, he wanted it a little bit larger. Lucia was 34 feet length overall. And uh, the Julia Bell, Daniel Bell Sharpie was 36 feet and slightly beamier, probably about eight feet um, wide. And this photo here is Julia Bell, quite possibly the first Sharpie constructed in North Carolina. And then the two vessels, um, now you had George Ives and Daniel Bell have a rematch. This time it's the North Carolina built Sharpie versus the Connecticut built Sharpie. And uh, they race this time on the Noose River uh, close to New Bern. Um, and they have hundreds of people are lining um, the waterfront of New Bern to, to watch this race go down. And ultimately uh, the Julia Bell the North Carolina built Sharpie wins the race and uh, this boat type uh, starts to take off very quickly um, in Eastern North Carolina. And so uh, do we have any questions yet? Ben and Christine. We don't have anything coming up on Facebook yet. Okay. All right, well, I'll just go ahead and uh, move along then. Um, so by 1881, um, we have George Ives wrote in an account of him uh, introducing the Sharpie to North Carolina. He wrote that at least 500 Sharpies and flat bottom skips have been built for the waters of Eastern North Carolina. Now it's, highly unlikely that there was 500 Sharpies actually built. But I think the more important thing to focus on is his statement that there are, there are Sharpies and flat bottom skiffs, um, emphasis on the flat bottom skiffs. And so uh, what he's talking about is there is this new form of boat building that has entered um, into Eastern North Carolina and has caused a revolution. Um, in boat building, and that is the cross-planked flat bottom construction. So with this first, you're building the sides of your boat, and then you're, you're building a cross-planked bottom, and the boat's being constructed upside down, and then when the bottom's complete, you flip it and you finish off the boat. It's a quick and easy way to build a flat bottom boat. It's how a lot of these Sharpies were constructed, um, and it's the way a lot of boats um, 
in Eastern North Carolina were built from the sort of final quarter of the um, 19th century all the way through the 20th century. And so why did the Sharpies quickly gain their popularity? Well, as I mentioned, the construction is pretty simple um, and it's quick. Um, it's also inexpensive. Uh, there's a lot of uh, lumber that was available. You had mill, lumber mills all over Eastern North Carolina. There's plenty of wood and it was easy to get a hold of. Um, the boats are also easy to maintain. If you're gonna be constantly shoveling fish and oysters out of the hold of the boat, you're gonna have uh, uh, shovels are gonna be wearing the bottom of your boat out, eventually wearing those bottom planks thin. You can pop those bottom planks out and then put new ones in relatively easily. Um, so again, it's easy to maintain. The boats were fast, they were maneuverable, um, which is ideal for getting your fish and your oysters back to shore, um, to the fish houses. Uh, they could go through extremely shallow water um, with uh, the, the flat bottom. Uh, they're a great platform for fishing and tonging, for their low freeboard. Um, and also, like I mentioned, you know, these large cypress and juniper logs that were being used to build these dugout canoe boats like the Cunner were just becoming harder and harder to build, um, especially as the timber industry was taking, really taking off um, in Eastern North Carolina. And so there's this other um, observation that was made by the Goldsboro Messenger. Um, so the aggregate tonnage of these little boats, which have taken the place of clinker boats, is given at 1,339 barrels. So these little boats are referring to, in the context of the article, what were Sharpies in Beaufort and Moorhead City. And they're talking about how these clinker built boats are, that were once popular in the area are quickly becoming phased out. And this is 1884. Um, and then barrels um, is a unit of measure from that time period. Um, generally, probably what they're referring to is uh, dry goods. So uh, a barrel, the standardized barrel for like, I think wheat or grain, it's about 118 pounds. So 118 times 1,339 is over 150,000 um, pounds. So, um, and, and a lot of these boats are averaging around five to 10 tons. So there's a lot of boats being built. Uh, then you have Charles Work wrote that on the beach, formerly only the dugout canoe was used, but now the Sharpie is displacing it, but it is slow work and it tears the heart of the Tar Heel to give up his favorite. So again, another boat, the dugout canoe, as I mentioned, it is also being phased out in favor of the Sharpie. And this is published in 1888. Okay, and so, um, so far this map uh, reflects uh, the, the research that I've done so far, indicating where Sharpies were constructed in Eastern North Carolina. See, there's a lot um, of locations um, in Carter County. Um, by and large, by the majority of Sharpies were being built in Carter County. We also had a lot of Sharpies being built in Craven, in Onslow, uh, New Hanover, and Brunswick counties as well. The boats were very popular in those locations. And a lot of these boats, not only are they being built in regular shipyards and marine, at marine railways, but they're also being built in people's backyards just because these boats are so quick and easy to build. Um, a lot of people were, were building them just about anywhere. And so um, there's several variations of the Sharpie in North Carolina, and that's what we're about to dig into. Um, so from 1876 to 1880, there's not a whole lot that's really changed in the design of the Sharpie. It retained that New Haven uh, style, uh, with most of the boats probably being in the 30-foot range, some going down into the 20-foot range. Um, kept that leg of mutton sail. And a lot of these boats are carrying around 100 to 200 bushels of oysters. And then you've got in the early 1880s, you're retaining that New Haven um, appearance, but the boats are just getting bigger and bigger. Still the same style of sails, but you're going up into the 45 foot range. Then you've got what's known as your spanker rigged Sharpies. Uh, so what's going on with these, you start to see the appearance 
um, of cabins um, on these boats. There's also um, a bowsprit. Um, you've got a mainsail right here, and then you've got a small mizzen, and this is where uh, your spanker um, sail is located right here. Um, they're still using sapling masts on these boats. So that's really um, it, limiting the size of the masts and limiting the size of the sails that can handle uh, because you have to worry about snapping a mast. Um, and in turn, this is limiting the size of your vessels. So most of these boats are in the sort of 40 foot range um, and they tend to be half decked and they're used for all sorts of purposes in Eastern North Carolina. And here's actually a slightly better photo. And you can see right here, a clear um, picture of the, the mizzen mast right here. And then in the background, you've got all these um, oyster shells and the men uh, hauling off buckets of oysters from these boats. And then you got from the mid to late 1880s, you see the rise of the gaff rig sharpies. Uh, these look a lot like schooners. Uh, they're not quite exactly schooners because they've got equal and near equal mast lengths. Uh, again, you still don't have any standing rigging. So the size of your sails your, um, are limited um, and uh, they're being used for all sorts of purposes in North Carolina. Then in 1889, you see the introduction of the uh, oyster dredge and a better tongs in Eastern North Carolina. And it's re really more um, significant is the oyster dredge, um, which is brought, which is introduced uh, to fishermen from the Chesapeake Bay. Chesapeake Bay had been uh, starting to see depletion with its um, oysters. And so they started coming into North Carolina to take oysters. And you had canneries from Baltimore opening up in North Carolina. And so, um, People from North Carolina, they, they adopt this dredge. But in order to actually take advantage of the dredge, uh, the Sharpies had to get bigger because um, you're, you're dragging a heavy metal object across the bottom of the sound to scoop up oysters. You need a lot of extra energy. So you need bigger sails um, and bigger masts. And so that's where your standing, uh, standing rigging comes into play. Um, you have longer bow sprits, um, big, huge gaff rig sails. And this is where the true sort of um, schooner um, rig uh, you, you see come into play. And this is the pinnacle of Sharpie design in North Carolina. This is your core sound Sharpie. Uh, probably when you see pictures of Sharpies in North Carolina, this is the, the most common one you see sometimes. Um, and these boats went all the way up into the 70 foot range. And then in 1895, North Carolina um, changed its uh, oyster dredging laws. And the law stated that no vessel over 25 tons or steam vessel of any kind of tonnage shall be allowed to use scoop or dredges in the waters of the state. And this law was on the books up until about 1933. Um, so you couldn't have any steam vessels or any sailboats um, that exceeded 25 tons. Um, dredging for oysters. And this was sort of the, th this really made the Sharpie um, probably more popular because this really, the Sharpie fit into that tonnage uh, lim uh, limitation. And so here's an image um, of a Sharpie um, taking on um, oysters and probably dredged up. Um, see, some African-Americans on deck. Uh, this pretty common occurrence. You might have the captain or the master uh, might be white, but you would have largely um, an African-American crew. Um, a lot of times these men um, were operating the dredges and doing a lot of the heavy labor um, aboard the, the vessel, bringing, hauling the, the oysters. And so uh, do we have any questions yet before we continue on? with the commercial fishing aspect. Do we have yeah, anything? We don't have any on uh, Zoom. I mean, uh, Facebook, but I think we had one come up on Zoom. Um, Does Christine have it? Uh, I'm not sure, but I see uh, uh, 
question from Chris. Okay. On Zoom, watching on Zoom, and he wanted is interested in knowing uh, what was used for joinery on the sharpies. So a uh, technical question about the construction. Oh man. Um... We'd have to we don't really know much. Maybe. We don't know a whole lot about the construction of these Sharpies because hard they don't exist anymore. They didn't survive. And we don't really have a whole lot of any archaeological remains of these boats. Um, the, the wood they're using on these boats um, was really cheap. Um, they're using a lot of pine, uh, which isn't always the best um, for uh, uh, keeping in the water. Um, and of course, they're also using a lot of um, iron fasteners. Um, and so these boats pretty much fell apart and they were really disposable. Um, we don't have, and I don't have any sort of line drawings or, or well, I've got line drawings, but uh, hardly any construction plans. Um, so I'm not really a whole, a whole lot um, up on the, the construction of these vessels, unfortunately. Most of what we just have are photos. Yeah, there might be a question. Uh, maybe Tim, our boat builder, could have some insight on. But uh, that, I think that's all the questions for, for right now. Okay. I'll move on then. Um, so more on the commercial fishing. Um, you had C.T. Watson was one of the largest uh, fish dealers in eastern North Carolina. He was based out of New Bern. And he had 50 to 60 Sharpies on contract with him, uh, bringing him oysters on a daily basis uh, throughout the oyster season. Uh, so you just have individual dealers, uh, wholesale fish dealers, um, have just a tremendous number of Sharpies uh, working with them. Uh, Newburn's a, a good example to talk about. They had this huge fish market. Um, here's an image right here where there's not very many boats in it at all. And then here's the, the same place, but just crammed full of Sharpies delivering uh, fish and oysters um, to Newburn. And actually someone like C.T. Watson actually owned property on both sides of this waterway. Um, but anyways, uh, the Noose River was filled uh, with nets, uh, a lot of gill nets, a lot of hull nets, um, a lot of drag nets were used. And a lot of them were fished by uh, black watermen um, operating on a share system. And to get all this fish um, to, uh, to, to market, you had these Sharpies acting as buy boats or, or run boats, um, going out to these fishermen and either buying the fish or just taking the fish back to New Bern. Uh, and a lot of these Sharpies are actually operated, again, by black watermen operating off of a share system. Um, And here's some examples of just the, these nets that are being used. So this is a drag net being used um, on the Noose River. And then uh, there's, this is sort of a style gill netting that would have been practiced um, on the Noose. Um, and then gill net, this sort of gill nets that are staked in place. Um, those were used as well. And then you had um, up on Croton Sound, there was a large um, Hulsane fishery um, that was fishing for uh, shad and herring. Um, it was owned by a man by the name of William Palin. And he actually had a Sharpie built for his fishery um, to take all, all the, the shad and herring that his fishery had, had landed um, in Dare County and ship them off to Elizabeth City where they were either taken to the market or they're taken to, um, to trains to be shipped up um, north uh, to, uh, to other markets. And then um, you had down in Brunswick County, you had all these inlets uh, where people are clamming and you have Sharpies would go down to these inlets, they would take the clams um, from the fishermen and they would take them to these, uh, these clam docks that are at these train stations um, where they would wash them, sock them, and, and load them up on the trains, and the trains would take them up to northern markets where they would fetch better prices. 
Um, and then there's also the Menhaden industry as well. Sharpies were used in it. Um, you can't quite see it too, that great in this photo, but right here, you've got a purse saying that's in the water. You've got these men operating these smaller boats and you got a Sharpie there supporting their operations. And the role of the Sharpies in the Menhaden industry was that it was there to carry the nets and the fishermen out to the fishing grounds. And then once they, they caught, um, I also towed these, these net skiffs, but it was uh, once they, they caught their fish, uh, they'd put them in the Sharpies and then the Sharpies would take them back to the Menhaden factories where they were then processed. Um, some of these uh, factories um, employed their own boat builders where they're building boats. Um, then some of them were um, built and owned independently. Um, but these Sharpies, were heavily dependent on the wind and the tide. So they had to stay primarily in the sounds close to the factories. And, and that wasn't really the ideal situation because the oil content in the Menhaden in the sounds wasn't as high um, as in the ocean. And so ultimately um, steamboats um, eventually became the preferred um, boat for the Menhaden fishery. And then here's another image of a, uh, of a large Sharpie, um, just full of Menhaden. And as you can see, this boat is registered out of Beaufort, North Carolina. And then just men uh, unloading Menhaden uh, from a Sharpie. And then, you know, the, the nets that are used in the industry. And then, you know, as I mentioned before, it's not just Menhaden, but other sort of commercial fishing practices where the boat is just, the Sharpie is really there to get the fishermen and the gear out to the fishing ground and then to bring the men and the equipment and the fish back uh, to, to shore, back to market. And a good example of this is uh, you had fishermen from Beaufort and Moorhead City would take their Sharpies um, out to New River Inlet and they'd set up um, uh, gill net um, fishing operations out there. Um, and we kind of know about this because it ticked off some of the fishermen uh, in Onslow County that this was going on. Um, but anyways, um, in rare instances, Sharpies were even involved in uh, the, the whaling industry here in North Carolina. Um, there's at least one um, incident where a Sharpie was involved and that was at Cape Lookout on April 3rd, 1898. Um, there was a whale that was um, killed and the whale had, had towed these men um, offshore and they were having trouble bringing the whale back to shore. And so they went and they, they got a friend with a Sharpie to help them tow um, the whale back to shore. And so that's at least one example of when a Sharpie had been used in whaling in North Carolina. Uh, this isn't quite commercial fishing, but it's related to the commercial fishing industry. And that is when the Save North Carolina was involved in, um, in rehabilitating the oyster beds. Um, They're trying to bring back um, these oyster beds by dumping empty oyster shells, a lot like what we still do today. They're just filling up Sharpies um, with these spent shells and dumping them out in the Pamlico Sound or dumping them out in places like Core Sound. Um, also, just um, experimental oyster beds um, with uh, trying to set up oyster gardens. Um, the Shellfish Commission North Carolina was involved in that. There's two uh, Sharpies, uh, the Mamie Daniels and the, uh, the Bracebridge, were, were both involved in that. And then uh, you had the Beaufort Laboratory uh, was involved in using Sharpies that uh, there's at least the, the Cerro was involved in biological surveys. Um, so marine fisheries research. And so do we have any questions right now? This is gonna wrap up the commercial fishing aspect. Yes, David, um, I've got several questions that came in on Facebook. Uh -huh. I think we might have another one on Zoom, but we'll start with these uh, that came through the Facebook. Live feed. Yep. So we have a uh, David wants to know um, do you have information or names of builders in Onslow County? Uh, and he, he says he has a great grandfather that did some boat building. Yeah, there's, um, gosh, I forget the first name, but there's a Willis 
in Swansboro um, who built Sharpies. He was originally from uh, down east, the, you know, one of the core sound communities, and he relocated uh, to Swansboro um, and he built a number of Sharpies there. There is also, um, I'll mention him later, another guy later in the, the presentation um, is Reinhardt um, Foster, who's a German immigrant who relocated to Swansboro in the 1880s and he built Sharpies as well. There's some other people, a lot of them are in Swansboro. Um, then there's a couple of communities um, that were, they're located out where um, Camp Lejeune is today. Uh, there's people building Sharpies out there as well. I forget some of those names off the top of my head. Yeah, one, uh, I was just going through uh, Sonny Williamson's little compilation of books which focuses on Carteret County and down east, but he has one listed out of the White Oak River area. Um, he doesn't yeah. say who the builder was, but he just yeah. listed it. Yeah, there, there's a there's a number of them down in, in that area. Um, so we've got a couple more questions okay. on Facebook. Um, uh, Philip uh, has a question um, when you when you use the term uh, in one of the slides, uh, black waterman uh, yeah. using the share system, uh, right? And he was curious to, to know if that is uh, kind of like the nautical version of um, uh, sharecropping. Um, no, so, so, oh, so the, I'm sorry, the, the share system is basically um, how the crew divided up the profits. Um, usually the captain, uh, you'd have the owner of the boat would receive um, usually a, a large portion and the captain or the master usually would receive uh, a large portion and then the, the crew would have a, a smaller um share in it um but yeah it's just it's just how profits um were divided um i'm not exactly sure how those profits were um proportional what were proportioned out um there's other industries where we know a little bit more about that um like the the mullet fisheries um a lot of them operated off of share systems and, and we know how those uh, were divided out, but not quite sure about these run boats and buy boats. Yeah. So uh, before I go on to the next one that's on uh, Facebook, uh, David uh, did say that his great grandfather that was building boats in Anzo County was named Teddy Hines. Okay. So I, don't, I don't know if you've come across that name in any of your no. research. Um, I, I haven't. Um, the so some of the boat builders are elusive um, because there's there's so many um, boats that were built, and um, yeah. we don't have that grave records for everything. There there is some things that um, that might be able to find in the national archives, um, but unfortunately with COVID going on, uh, yeah. you can't go up there. They're closed. For the time we got a, another question on, on Facebook. Uh, this is from Matt, and he wants to know if there are any plans available for study or building um, for uh, amateur wooden boat builders. And, and I think he's, uh, this is specifically maybe for Sharpies. So um, I think the North Carolina Maritime Museum, we sell um, plans for the ID, which is a small sort of recreational um, Sharpie. Um, and um, I think it's in the 20 foot range. Um, that's one that we have. Um, there are plans available through other museums. Um, there is, uh, I, I know Mystic Seaport um, sells some um, okay. for the more like the New Haven style. Yeah, yeah that's what I'm gonna do. Okay. But yeah, I don't have any, but um, the, so you can go to the archives, the Smithsonian. Um, those archives. Um, you can actually order them from the Smithsonian as well. Um, and then uh, last question for right now, this one's off of Zoom. Uh, mm -hmm. This is from Chris and he wants to know, did the larger Sharpies have any an appreciable hold? Um, and if so, was the hold uh, used for product? Um, yes. Slide pictures of. Uh, 
Yeah, so the uh, we'll see some, uh, yeah, yeah they, they did have um, a large hold. The holds weren't very deep. Um, so your the average depth of these boats is about probably two to four feet. Um, usually a lot of times it's two to three feet. It's, it's, they're not very deep, um, but they, I've got a couple of photos where you can see they've really loaded these boats down. Um, but um, uh, is there any other questions? Uh, that, uh, that's all I see for right now. So we'll go ahead. Okay. Well, just to move along then. And then so coastal trade and transportation. And here's a photo of the Alfonso right here, really loaded down with sacks. Uh, might be gotten grain, who knows, but there's not a whole lot of freeboard right here. Uh, the boat is extremely low in the water around the stern. So that's sort of an example right there of how they're loading these boats down. Um, so the major products that are being transported um, in the coastal trade in North Carolina, uh, largely, and, and I think I've got these ranked. Um, it's fish and oysters, um, a lot, uh, agricultural products, uh, lumber, shingles, uh, naval stores like turpentine, rosin, and then you just have your sort of general merchandise. So like goods you would buy in a store. And so here's an example of, uh, of course, on uh, uh, Sharpie, the, it's, it's spelled Iowa, but it's, a lot of people pronounce it Iowa, and is built by Van Buren Salter. Um, and then you've got um, and, and the reason people uh, really got into these Sharpies in terms of freighting is because uh, not like that earlier, they're cheap and easy to build, but you can also cut out the middlemen. So you had all these farmers and merchants in Eastern North Carolina for a long time. They were, de they were depending on these shipping companies to move their products um, up and down the coast. And once these cheap and easily built boats came about, they're saying, well, why don't we buy or build our own Sharpies. And then we can um, take control um, of our sort of logistics and, and how we move products. And so we don't have to pay someone else to do this for us anymore. And, and that's another reason why these Sharpies became uh, really popular. And so um, here's a map um, of Carteret and you know, part of Craven and Onslow counties. And so um, what I really wanna emphasize here is the club foot in Harlow Creek Canal, which cuts through Carteret County and links uh, the Newport River to the Noose River. And this was a really important trade route um, for the coastal freight. A lot of people were wanting to get their products to New Bern because there's a big railroad hub, is big business hub for Eastern North Carolina. So people from Swan and people from places like Swansboro and Moorhead Beaufort um, they would ship products through this canal and up to New Bern, and they could do it pretty quickly. Um, and so here's a, another just sort of map of this. You've got Beaufort here, you've got, uh, you've got Moorhead right here, you've got the, the Newport River here, and then you've got your, your creek and your canal. And then you have this sort of smaller, this might be hard, harder to see, but you've got uh, where the canal is coming out into the noose. And it's really narrow and it, it's shallow and at times in its history, it hasn't, hadn't been that well maintained, um, but this preceded the sort of intercoastal waterway um, that was later built. Um, so people from Beaufort could get to Newburn pretty quickly. In one instance, uh, you had the Sharpie George and Ives, named after George Ives, made it from Beaufort to Newburn in six hours. Now this was under ideal conditions, um, but it just shows that people could get there, um, could move around pretty quickly using this waterway. And it was, and the Sharpie was ideal for it because it's so narrow and at times very shallow, especially the approaches to the canal uh, were, uh, uh, were shallow. Here's an image of the three Samuels. This is another Sharpie. It is loaded down with, um, with lumber. It's taking on lumber right here. And he, as you can see, it's, it's stacked up pretty high on this boat. Again, uh, the holds on these vessels weren't that large. Um, so they, there was a tendency to stack up your cargo. Um, here's a, a, a route I found um, 
for two Sharpie captains out of uh, Salter Pass. Um, and primarily we're kind of sticking to the Bogue sound area. They'd go from Salter Path to Swansboro, from Swansboro to Moorhead, then to Beaufort, and then back to Salter Path. And that was just a sort of general trade route that they're running. Uh, and then as you can see, this navigation map, um, from the 19th century of Bogue Sound, very shallow. It looks like average around two, three feet um, in a lot of places. And then um, just a quick, another example, um, we had Sharpies coming out of Atlantic. They'd go around this peninsula that's of the Carter County and then into the Noose and up into New Bern. Or what they sometimes did is if they were gonna do business in Beaufort and Moorhead, They'd shoot down course sound, go to the Beaufort, take on some cargo or drop off cargo, go to the Moorhead, do the same there, then head up the Clubfoot and Harlow Creek Canal and off to New Bern. It's another route. And then they would go, of course, go back around to Atlantic um, or some, yeah. And then we got this quote here that unquestionably the type of craft best adapted to purely local purposes, the shoals are very extensive with two to three feet of water and only the Sharpie can be navigated all around. This is core sound. Round bottoms would have to confine themselves to channels and are for that reason of limited service in core sound. So the Sharpie is pretty much the ultimate boat for core sound. And of course, another navigation map here, section of core sound, two to three feet in a lot of areas, even less in others. There's a Sharpie, the Ella Crosby. It was a large Sharpie schooner um, out of Elizabeth City, and it linked um, the residents of Manio and Nags Head uh, to Elizabeth City. It would run this triangular route um, several times um, a week, and it would take passengers and goods for trade, um, all sorts of stuff. Then there's this, uh, uh, the, the communities of Onslow County were uh, linked rather tightly to Wilmington for trade. And so uh, this is the, the New River uh, to Wilmington route that a lot, a lot of Sharpies took. And uh, it was important that Sharpies were used because this is New River Inlet and New River Inlet had a lot of shoaling problems um, and it was, it was hard to get through at times. And uh, sometimes a Sharpie was the best boat to do that. And then here's a, just a, a Sharpie that was built by Reinhold Foster from Swansboro. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, he was a German immigrant um, who came to Swansboro in the 1880s and built Sharpies. And then you had um, the Lockwood Folly um, River route, uh, which ran from here um, and up to Wilmington. It was a very common route. Um, again, Lockwood's Folly Inlet um, and Lockwood Folly River difficult to navigate, extremely tricky. You would need a boat with a very shallow draft to make it through um, and the Sharpie fit that bill. And then uh, again, Shalote to Wilmington, um, same deal there, very difficult getting through the Shalote River and in inlet, um, just shallow water. And then these Sharpies were also utilized in ocean going trade. Uh, you have, you know, these some of these larger Sharpies would go all the way to New York City, or some even went all the way down into the West Indies um, to facilitate trade. And here's an example of one of the really big Sharpies, uh, the Prince, um, which was originally built in Wilmington, um, but owned uh, by Captain Beveridge of Beaufort. And then, uh, Something that is lost um, that doesn't get talked about a whole lot is that you had Sharpies on government contracts or bringing supplies uh, to lighthouses that are out in the sounds, but also the lighthouses that are out in the Outer Banks, um, like Cape Lookout and Cape Hatteras. Um, they're just bringing them, you know, the supplies they need. Uh, the really big important supply is the oil um, for the, the giant, um, the, the lights for the lighthouse. And then in Carter County, we know that they're even used as pilot boats. Uh, the pilots would go out um, through Beaufort Inlet, uh, meet the ships, um, get aboard and help them come through Beaufort Inlet and into Beaufort. 
So we have any questions? Yeah, we're getting some great ones here on Facebook. So let me uh, mm -hmm. scroll through and, and read them out to you. Um, so we have uh, Robert that's watching and uh, he says he's actually originally from, or he's from New Haven, Connecticut, uh, mm -hmm. home of George Ives. And he, uh, so he says, you know, like you talked about, about you know, George moving down here and getting into the oyster business um, and oyster shipping using the Connecticut method. Uh, and he's curious to know if, if that happened. Uh, and he says that it was a particular way, I guess, that uh, they sh maybe packed or shipped them. It was like a, a metal container that might have looked like a uh, butter turn that was put in a barrel of ice. Uh, and I don't, so I guess he's asking if, if that was something that was implemented here in coastal I'm not North Carolina. Sure, because we don't have those details on how they're packaging um oysters uh they might have it looks like they're mostly doing them in wooden barrels it's kind of hard to it, it, it's hard to say at all just because we don't have that information um most of the information that we have um on these techniques are coming out of the um uh the u.s fish commission one of the studies they had done um in the 1870s late 1870s and uh, they don't have all, all those really specific details um and i haven't seen um mention in other sources of, of how they're shipping them exactly in north carolina i think it's mostly you know boxes and barrels they're using yeah it seems like with the uh, um the unavailability of ice in the area that that, that particular method the, might have been there, there are northerners that move down that i'm in september i think it's september i'm doing a whole program on northerners moving down into north carolina after the civil war and getting involved in the commercial fishing trade there yeah. were northerners who moved to new Bern and they started a couple of ice plants where they're artificially manufacturing ice in the uh in the 19th late 19th century okay. um, and oh. so you, you kind of get to and then there's even an ice plant that gets established in moorhead city so eventually uh th they're not relying on these ice shipments coming down from um from new england anymore okay. uh we got a couple more questions here so uh philip is uh in is asking about the uh, commerce that went through um, the Clubfoot Creek, the canal there. And yeah. he's asking, did those goods largely stay in Eastern North Carolina um, or it, did any amount of it get transported to other parts of the, the state or, or even out of state? Uh, then um, he uh, asked, did, did a shorter path play any role in the revenues? Um, um, those who so it? if it's seafood, it's probably not staying within North Carolina. Most seafood that was caught in North Carolina is going up north to places like New York and Philadelphia, Baltimore, uh, Richmond, um, just places where people are gonna get more money for it. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of other goods, uh, general merchandise goods. A lot of that is staying locally. That's gonna be sort of in the local economy for Eastern North Carolina. Um, then, there's um, a lot of lumber and it's hard to say exactly where some of that lumber is going. Um, I imagine some of it is being um, shipped out of state, but a lot of it is probably being consumed in state as well for construction purposes. Mm -hmm. and, and what we, what we have though, we have information on what type of cargo is going through that canal, how frequently it is, the sort of tonnage. Um, but ultimately we don't always have the information of where it's going to get distributed once it meets its destination. Um, so it's kind of hard to say. Yeah. So he, he was wondering if the, uh, if they got better prices, the, the, the faster the product they got yeah. the fastest you got better prices yeah i mean yeah most certainly when it comes to things um like uh you know seafood and stuff um but also just you're if you're shipping stuff that's taking up a lot of time um and there are some people who do get into the shipping business um almost exclusively um 
that are the, these people who, you know, trying to avoid middlemen, so they built their own Sharpies, but then there's some people who just built Sharpies to start their own shipping firms. And so, yeah, I mean, the faster you can move your product, the, the better it's going to be. It's also, it's going to be a hassle going through core sound. Um, it's going to, it just takes longer to go all the way around, yeah. Yeah. Um, especially for people in like Swansboro. Yeah. What's the incentive? A, we have a question from Matt and mm -hmm. he wants to know uh, what are any of the, the differences between the Sharpie and the Skipjack, which is, I guess, out of the uh, Chesapeake Bay area. Maybe. Yeah. So the Skipjacks are built um, usually from logs. Um, they're also... Yeah, they're also uh, generally uh, single masted um, boats. Um, I believe, I haven't studied skipjacks as much. I believe they might be dead rise as well. They seem a little wider, animals. wider to me, but maybe that's just because they're not warrant. Some of them weren't. Yeah, yeah, I've actually got a, I actually have a book on skipjacks in my backpack right now. I've been trying to find the time to get around to reading. Um, but there's a lot of skipjacks that came down into North Carolina. From the Chesapeake Bay to get in yeah. on the uh, oyster industry, and then um, we have a question on come in on Zoom, and this is from Chris, and uh, he is asking what business owned the Ella Crosby, or what was the destination in Elizabeth City? It might Ooh, have been the other way around. I'm like, trying to remember the name of the it. Gosh, I know the owners were based out of. I forget the names of the people. I have them in my notes. Um, and if Chris wants to send me an email, um, I can tell him where I found that information. Um, a lot of where I found the information came from a, a lawsuit that arose um, because there were goods that weren't, that were, that ship was supposed to be shipping and it wasn't being shipped they're they're supposed to have had an exclusive i think they're supposed to have had an exclusive contract with some business and that business was also shipping some of their product by another uh vessel um out to the outer banks and there's a, a lawsuit that arose from that and i'm tr i cannot remember the names of the owners um off the top of my head but if you shoot me an email i'll get it for you later and i sent i put your email address up there and then we got one more question on on facebook and this is from bob and he wants to know who brought the Sharpie to Cortez, Florida, and why. Oh, you know what? I um, I forget the name. There's actually um, Howard Chappelle writes about the Sharpie down in Florida, and it comes down a little bit after um, the uh, the Sharpie does in North Carolina. I forget the name of the. The man who does and i can't remember the circumstances just because i didn't focus on florida that much because it's out of area right. um but if you look at the works of howard Chappelle, um there's two books to look at a small his small book on small watercraft and then he wrote a um a paper that was published called a migration of a boat type and that paper you can find online um it was published through the smithsonian Okay. And that has details there. Okay. And Robert says Commodore Monroe, but I don't, maybe that's in response to yeah, the question. Yeah, uh, the Commodore is a familiar name of a vessel. That is that one that was in Florida? Or? I can't remember off the top of my head. It's so like I said, I didn't spend much time looking at Florida. Yeah. All right. Uh, that's good. Questions for now, so maybe. Move okay, on. so we're getting towards the end. I'm just going to touch on recreation very lightly here because I'm doing a presentation um, next month um, in May on uh, early coastal tourism in Eastern North Carolina, and the Sharpie is has this rich history when it comes to coastal tourism and to recreation. And so I'm gonna focus more on it in that talk, but um, just real quickly, I'll note, uh, you've got, it seems that yachting in Sharpies first arose uh, on the Noose River. And uh, I found an article on it that um, talked about it and they, they called it an innocent form of 
um, recreation for young men. You had these young business professionals in Newburn who were building and racing Sharpies. And um, this was sort of innocent form of recreation compared to something like drinking and gambling and womanizing. Um, and then you see in 1876, you know, you got Sharpies three being built for recreation on the noose in Newburn. And then 1877, you've got five being built for recreation. And it just sort of takes off from there. Um, but the first regatta um, involving um, multiple Sharpies um, is in July 4th, 1877 at Newburn. Six out of the nine boats competing were Sharpies and Sophie, uh, one of the Sharpies racing was the one that won the race. And then I've got uh, chartering Sharpies. So yeah, the early charter boat industry of North Carolina, Sharpies were very much involved in. They took people out fishing or ferried them to the beach. They do these daytime sailing cruises and they even did these nighttime sailing cruises as well. And I've got an aver newspaper advertisement of the Atlantic Hotel in Moorhead City and um, uh, they had their own fleet of Sharpies that people could go out on. And there's just tons and tons of Sharpies um, in Carter County. Um, by the 1890s, you had over hundred Sharpies between Beaufort and Moorhead City that were taking tourists out in the water. And something else to note about these Sharpies in the chartering industry, a lot of them, they were fishermen who were taking a break during the summertime. They found that they could make a lot of money by catering to tourists, by taking them out on trips. And so they primarily fish, you know, in the, the fall, the winter, um, in the spring commercially, but during the summer, they're catering to, to tourists. Um, and then um, hunting as well, Sharpies were used a lot in waterfowl hunting and like Core Sound. You had this uh, wealthy um, men from uh, New Jersey in this newspaper article um, had the Ida May um, it was another large Sharpie uh, built in Moorhead City specifically for hunting in Eastern North Carolina. And then here's a, just an image of a Sharpie being used for yachting. Uh, and this is, image was taken on the Tar River um, in North Carolina, Pamlico Tar. And then I'm just gonna touch quickly on maritime accidents because maritime accidents kind of help us tell the story. And there's all sorts of information that you find on boats and crew and owners and, and all sorts of things. Um, but there's a good story here, a quick one. Um, there is a, a Sharpie that was overloaded in Onslow County with salt. And when the captain uh, walked away, uh, the boat sank and when he came back, it was underwater. Um, and it was just a total loss. So they just, they put way too much cargo um, on the boat. And then there's the wreck of the ML, um, which is an interesting story. Um, the ML was a large, uh, fairly large, decent sized Sharpie um, that was owned by the George Hewitt, or George Hewitt and his brothers, um, who was an African-American family from Supply, North Carolina. So Supply is up here. Uh, it's on the Lockwood, it's off of the uh, Lockwood Fly River. Um, and they were going, they're doing business down in uh, this area in Seaside, or they're transporting lumber um, and they ran aground and sank um, here in Tubbs Inlet. And it, it's just, I, I like little stories like this. It's, it's a tragedy, but it's just showing that, you know, these boats are, are open to everyone. Uh, you've got, you know, lots of African-Americans who are not only crew members on boats that are owned by, you know, white businessmen, but you've also got African-American families that are, um, pulling their, their wealth and resources together. Um, and they're building these boats and operating them um, in private business. And then I don't have any navigation maps of Tubbs Inlet, but this is what it looks like today, a uh, satellite image. So uh, it's really tricky today. I, I can't imagine what it would have been like in 1900. And then there's also a sort of interesting story, really terrifying um, of this, uh, black waterman who um, he's tacking um, Smithfield, which is today Southport. Um, he's tacking over by Southport um, and his foot becomes entangled in the line. And when his boat goes a turn, he swept overboard and he's dragged underwater for at least 200 feet. 
Um, fortunately, there's some men from a steamer, the Madeline, that see him, um, and they, they come to his rescue, and he's almost drowned, but he fortunately, he survives. Um, and then there's a tons of collisions that took place on the Cape Fear River uh, between Sharpies and um, steamboats, and just one is the Enterprise, uh, which is a large Sharpie um, that collided with a steamboat at night, cut in half, capsized, uh, and there's crew of the Enterprise trapped below deck, and fortunately, the men from the steamboat uh, jumped on top of the Sharpie with axes and cut um, the crew out, so no one died, fortunately, but it was a, a near, uh, near tragedy. And then just the decline in the Sharpie and, and why these boats declined. Um, you had the expansion of railroads. So why ship um, goods by water when you've got um, you know, vessels, you don't, or railroads, you don't have to worry about wind and tide and you don't have to worry about vessels wrecking. And then especially for this part of the Southeastern part of the state, you have these rail lines are coming in and they sort of expanding and branching off. And so, you know, all these smaller communities had started to have access to the railroads, which tied them into places like Newburn and Wilmington. Didn't quite need the Sharpies as much anymore. You have the decline of the longleaf pine. Which longleaf pine was instrumental, which was which, which key to the, the naval stores uh, industry, the turpentine and rosin. Once these trees were in decline, uh, they just, naval stores started to dry up. Uh, and naval stores were, was a huge product that was shipped uh, by these Sharpies. And then there's changes in agriculture in the, the southeastern part of the state, less and less um, agricultural products being generated. It's less cargo um, for these Sharpies. And then, of course, you had storms, the infamous hurricane of 1933 that came through and just destroyed tons of Sharpies. Um, also, you have in the early 20th century, you have the motorization of Sharpies. George Ives, the man who actually introduced the Sharpie to North Carolina, is the one who first um, motorized a Sharpie for the sea bass um, fishery. And, um, but unfortunately, with, with motorization, they had all these problems, structural problems. Um, fasteners started coming loose due to the vibrations and leaks around the prop shaft. It just wasn't good for the overall health of the vessel. But nonetheless, people motorized these boats. And here's an example of a sketch that a Northern yachtsman did of a North Carolina Sharpie in Core Sound. And the owner had placed the engine in the cabin and they had placed the fuel tank towards the bow here in the Sharpie. And then you have all these um, large Sharpie schooners, these coarse sound Sharpies that were um, converted from being sailing vessels to motorized vessels. A lot of them became Menhaden boats. So examples, the Alfonso right here. And then you have an image of the Alfonso right here as a converted Menhaden boat. And then ultimately uh, the Alfonso later became the Museum of the Sea here in downtown um, uh, uh, Beaufort. Then you had, of course, on Sharpie, the Sickle, um, which was first a you know, schooner Sharpie, and then again became converted to a motorized Menhaden vessel right here. And then the Sickle towards the end of its life, I believe this is probably Pelletier Creek. And then you have the Reaper, which was another Sharpie that had been converted to become a Menhaden boat. But the, sometimes these vessels weren't used just for Menhaden fishing. They're used year round sometimes for other purposes. The Reaper in this instance was used for shark fishing at times. This is probably um, used by Cecil Nelson out of Moorhead City. Um, he was in the, the 30s and 40s, really the only uh, commercial shark fisherman um, in Eastern North Carolina. So um, this probably involves Cecil Nelson here. 
Then you have the emergence of new watercraft. You have these smaller skiffs that have the lines and sort of they greatly resemble Sharpies, but they've got these inboard motors here. And these boats probably are being used as scallop dredge boats. You've got a scallop dredge here. And, and this is generally what a lot of these sort of scallop, um, small scallop dredge boats looked like um, in, uh, it, in around Beaufort, Moorhead City um, uh, in, in the, you know, the 30s, that sort of time period. Um, then you have the rise of the core sounder. Uh, you had Brady Lewis, who was originally from Salter Path, moved out uh, to Harker's Island, and he started, he really founded this style of boat, um, you know, had this rounded stern. A lot of the, the lines, um, everything just sort of resembles other Sharpie, but with the core sounder, you have um, dead rise. Um, so V bottom is also integrated. Um, into this. And that's so they could get in and out of the inlets a lot easier. Um, and, and that's really how the Sharpie's legacy um, lived on. And these boats over time, or probably around the 70s, they kind of did away with the rounded stern, went for more of a, a squared, uh, squared off transom. And then the, uh, the flare and the bow became more and more exaggerated. And that's kind of where we have um, our sort of modern day sports boats in Eastern North Carolina. Um, you know, you, you have this vessel, the Sharpie, that starts off looking a certain way, and then it just evolves and inspires other boats. And then finally, you know, you have designs that look nothing like a Sharpie today, but the, the legacy there is, is connected to these vessels. And so do you have any questions? And that's, this is pretty much it for the presentation. That's, that's my conclusion. Okay. Yeah. No, that's great, David. Um, we don't have uh, any more questions right now. We had just some comments that uh, that folks really in, enjoyed watching your presentation, um, and they're looking forward to more presentations about the Sharpie. So yeah, so you got some work to do. Um, yeah. So yeah. <laughs> so if people tune in, um, you know, the in in May, um, I'll be talking a lot about coastal tourism, and. Um, the Sharpie is going to be pretty prominent in that discussion, along with other sort of uh, classic um, vessels from Eastern North Carolina. Great. Um, yeah, thanks again. And uh, Chris watching on Zoom says great presentation. So uh, we had a lot of good questions and comments. We really enjoy the uh, folks out there um, and interacting with them. Um, so thank you, David, for, for that presentation. Yeah. Uh, we just want to um, reiterate that we have another one coming up next week, and I'll be giving that one. Um, my name is Ben, and I work on the education staff, but uh, the next week's presentation is the explosion um, that happened on the steamer Pulaski, and that was in 1838, and it happened off of uh, New River Inlet. So, you know, David had talked about maritime accidents, and this is one of the worst ones in North Carolina's uh, history as far as uh, casualties. So, uh, tune in for that next Thursday, same time, 11 o'clock. Uh, we really appreciate everybody watching, and thank you, uh, David, for putting this together. So, everyone, have a great afternoon. Go get something to eat and enjoy the rest of Earth Day. So, Thank you, everybody.